Has Turkey shifted its strategic gaze from west to east? While relations with Israel have soured and the dream of EU membership remains a distant prospect, Ankara has been building new political and economic alliances with Arab neighbors, with Russia and Iran. My guest today is Mehmet Shimshek, Turkey's finance minister. Can Turkey afford to upset Washington and Brussels as it flexes its strategic muscle? Mehmet Shimshek, welcome to Hard Talk. Thank you. Is it fair to say that Turkey is disillusioned with the fruits, or the lack of fruits, to come from the long-term alliance with the United States, with NATO, with the EU? Not really, no. I mean, it's true that we are rediscovering our neighborhood, and it makes a lot of sense. It actually strengthens Turkey rather than weakens the case. Uh, there is a bit of a sense of disappointment with the EU, of course. I mean, EU, I think, right now lacks the kind of strategic vision or the, the kind of leadership that is required to look at Turkey from a different perspective. Because Turkey is an asset for Europe rather than liability. But unfortunately, when you focus on short-term political issues domestically in certain countries, you tend to see that vision sort of not coming through appropriately. I, I'm surprised in a way at your frankness. You are prepared to tell me that in Ankara there is real disappointment with what you hear and what you see from the U European Union. I mean, if, if somebody keeps telling you that you're not loved, at least from certain circles, there will be some sense of disillusionment. But our uh, improved relations with our neighborhood, with Arab nations, with, with Russia, with Iran, has little to do with that. It's not an alternative. I mean, we want to join European Union, not because we are obsessed with, with EU as a club, because we see that being the reference, the anchor for Turkey's own political, economic, and social transformation. EU has been the engine of change in, 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 in my country. It, Turkey has made significant progress in terms of boosting fundamental rights and freedoms enhancing its standards of its democracy, uh, building stronger institutions, acquiring first world you know, uh, regulations, rules, European acquis. We've benefited tremendously, and we would like to continue with this transformation. That's good for Turkish people. But before we get into the detail mm -hmm. of that, and we will get into that detail, is there not just a more basic point? Turkey's government right now is uh, dominated by the AK party, which is a conservative party with roots in the Islamic political movement in Turkey and is not the simple truth that there is a natural sympathy and perhaps an inclination toward looking to the Islamic world and to the Middle East rather than focusing on relations with Brussels and Washington from that it's, government. It's partly true. Um, it's true that the neighborhood that we have was ignored for decades. Turkey's westward march does not have to come at the cost of ignoring its immediate neighborhood, Muslim countries or Arab, Arab nations. That would be the wrong way of looking at it. Do you think the Western uh, allies that Turkey has had for so many decades wanted Turkey to steer clear of those neighbors? I'm not really sure about that, but maybe that was the perceived message, or maybe that's how Turkey wanted to disconnect from its past, you know, break with its past. You remember, Turkey was established on the ruins of Ottoman Empire. And Ottoman Empire had obviously was a vast empire, had all these ethnic groups and, and all these regions. So um, new Turkey, of course, had in its sort of uh, long-term uh, objectives had European Union in general, West, Western standards, Western standards of living, Western standards of democracy, Western standards in many other ways. So. I think what, what is happening is, yes, AK Party, uh, when, you come, when it comes to traditional values, family, etc., is conservative, that's true. But when it comes to economy, when it comes to international relations, it's actually quite liberal. 
is quite open and is quite pro-Western. I mean, we are we were the party. Our party was you know, the Justice and Development Party. My party was the party that managed to push through all those reforms that ultimately secured EU accession talks. Until 2004, many governments had EU as their number one interna you know, foreign policy objective, but none of them had the gut, will, or at least the power to push through the required reforms to satisfy Copenhagen criteria. So I think. We need to look at it in a more balanced way. All right, well, you, you talk about satisfying Copenhagen criteria. That sounds a bit technical, but let's be very blunt about it. You aren't satisfying the European Union. Uh, it is possible to say that you've got the beginnings of an ac accession uh, process, but on, they call them chapters, on 35 chapters that are, have to be negotiated for Turkey to uh, complete the accession process, you've only begun work on 13. Eight are suspended, and on key issues like Cyprus, there is a complete stalemate. So Turkey, frankly, is in deep freeze when it comes to the European Union. Again, it's partly true. That's not because of well, Turkey. What's not true about the, it? It's, the, it's completely let, true, isn't let, it? You have a big problem. No, no. The, the, the facts are obviously there. But let's put it this way. Politics of enlargement has been extremely unfavorable. Europe, there is, in Europe, uh, in my view, there is enlargement fatigue. After the 10 countries acceded and then two others, there has been a lot of soul searching, there's been a lot of debate. And Turkey is no ordinary candidate. So understandably, there are issues. We are ready to open almost all 35 chapters. In fact, some of the chapters, we don't, the Commission has not required us any sort of prior actions. So we're ready. But Europe is not ready. And, and Europe issues... won't be ready. I mean, President Sarkozy, uh, Chancellor Merkel in Germany, they've made it quite plain that as far as they are concerned, whatever you say and whatever you do, Turkey in the end cannot have full membership. It can have privileged partnership, it can have some sort of common economic area, but it cannot have full membership, period. We will not settle for anything short of first-class membership. And I believe that ultimately Europe needs Turkey as much as Turkey needs Europe, and Europe will come to Turkey and ask it to join in the long run. That, that, that's the point, in isn't the long it? Run. You, you seem to be close to a position where you're saying, to heck with Europe's technicalities and this whole procedure. We're going to frankly say to Europe, we're an important growing economy. We have much greater growth than you do. Our economy is much more vibrant than yours. You call us when you're ready to reopen this process. Is that what you're saying? I mean, I wouldn't, be, I wouldn't go that far, but I think it's close to that. Let me just How close? mention uh, one study. Uh, Goldman produced a study on emerging markets a couple of years ago. They see Turkey becoming the third largest economy in Europe after the United Kingdom and Russia by 2050 and the ninth largest in the world with six trillion dollars of GDP, sixty thousand dollar GDP per capita. Now, uh, Turkey is dynamic. Turkey is an asset for Europe. If Europe really wants to remain significant, both in economic terms, in political terms, in military terms, in many other terms, in this neighborhood, they will need Turkey rather than we want to be firmly anchored to Europe. So I think ultimately but, but hang on a minute, if I may, uh, Mr. Minister, you're sounding very self-confident, but let us not forget that right now Turkey is deeply dependent on European EU trade. More than 50% of your trade is with Europe, That's and right. indeed much more than 50% of your uh, foreign direct investment comes from True. Europe. So if you find your relationship with the EU souring, as it looks as though it might, you have a big problem. No, 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 no. I mean, the, the, the enlargement, pro the accession process is slow and it's nonlinear, it's not smooth. That's true. But that by no means, it, it doesn't mean that the EU Customs Union Agreement is at stake here. Europe has benefited tremendously by letting Turkey into EU Customs Union. We've had massive trade deficit with EU. We are the seventh largest trading partner with EU. So it's not only Turkey losing out of this, it's true. Uh, about, uh, you know, at the peak, about 57% of expo our exports were destined to Europe. About 60 to 70% of tourists come from Europe. About 60 to 70% of foreign direct investments are sourced from European Union. So there's no question that we are highly integrated and that is critical and that will remain so. What we are discussing here is ultimately 
the full membership. The economic, uh, in some way, the economic union has partially already materialized since 1996. Why would you want to go further? For example, why would you want to consider, as part of full membership, joining the Eurozone when you see from afar that the Eurozone is in a complete mess? I'm just wondering whether, in the end, Turks like yourself at the very top of government are scratching your heads and thinking, maybe our strategic plan of the last decade isn't quite right. Maybe Europe's time has been and gone and we do need, for economic as well as political reasons, to be looking eastward because the center of gravity in the world is shifting. You're right. You're right. I think uh, 